I think we are amongst friends here. I've seen many good friends, and I apologize that I was not here yesterday. But in UNESCO, we celebrated the Vesak Day, uh, which is, of course, the birthday of the Buddha. And it was not only about Buddhism, but it was about interface and intercultural dialogue. We invited religious leaders from all over the world, also from the Levant. So I felt myself as part of the introductory session of this very important seminar. First of all, I really would like to congratulate to you, Mr. President, and of course it was great to see the President of Albania, the President of Moldavia, and there are really only presidents and great academics sitting there and people who are really committed towards building bridges between cultures, peoples. So um, it is a little bit more than a greeting from UNESCO, but I would like to share with you. But uh, I was thinking, really, uh, before uh, writing my speech, what is UNESCO's contribution to this topic? And I won't be able to tell everything, because then we would spend our very precious time here uh, the whole day, but I am really concentrating on the most important developments, what we can do in terms of bridge building between Europe and the Levant. Your Excellencies, dear guests, our world is a rapidly changing, volatile place now. The political and social transformations in the Arab world have caught us by surprise. And we are still trying to make sense of them, worried about where the new processes may lead to. Global climate change is confronting us with a number of possible scenarios, worst of which include catastrophic changes to the human living habitat. The grand European experiment in gradual unification seems to be at the verge of being undone by the financial and fiscal pressures, threatening to set back the process for several decades probably. Time and again, we see the emergence and re-emergence of violent conflict in the areas where the people are already suffering from the debilitating effects of poverty, malnutrition, lack of access to basic health and educational services. So, what can be the role of UNESCO in this picture? And how can we affect positive change? As the president of the General Conference of UNESCO, and of course as a committed cross-culture bridge builder for about three decades, I would argue that the use of the soft power has not been used in full potential yet. Soft power is the most effective way in building bridges between peoples, countries, cultures, different civilizations, giving a chance for sharing better understanding, solidarity with each other. I always say that cultural diplomacy gives us a hope, at least, for not to misunderstand, but understand each other. Professor George, Joseph Nye, in the early 90s, introduced this notion first, soft diplomacy. In an original sense of the term, soft power is a cap capability to advance the national interest and increase the national security of a country through cultural diplomacy, through strategic communications, through providing humanitarian and developmental aid. But soft power doesn't have to originate within a single state or even a particular region. Soft power can be projected by an organization that has sufficient weight on the global level to transform people's mind around the world. The mission of UNESCO is to transform the minds of men and women towards thinking and living in peace through promoting education, through collaborating, collaborations to advance scientific knowledge, through the celebration and protection of human cultural diversity to build the defenses of peace in the minds of men and women, as UNESCO's constitution declares, is the very essence of our organization. 
UNESCO represents a vision of the world where the only legitimate power is soft. And through this soft power, UNESCO helps peoples and societies to transform and to learn the culture of peace. UNESCO exercises its soft power through cultural, sports and science diplomacy, international communication, advocating the knowledge-based societies, and other forms of constructive, mutually beneficial relationships built not only amongst official state institutions, but across wide network of NGOs and involving artists, scientists, researchers, academics, educators, writers, and other professionals. We should, of course, not fall into the delusion that the influence of cultural diplomacy is one directional, as I see very often, originating from the West and spreading to the rest of the world. For instance, the ideas of nonviolent resistance that continues to shape social and political movements around the world is associated with such names as Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela as much as it is with Martin Luther King Jr. The resurgence and the popularity of ideas of harmonious coexistence among various layers of society are linked with Confucius, Taoism, Buddhism, and represent the growing soft power of Eastern cultures, especially China. The popularity and the appeal of soft power emanating from the non-Western sources has been amplified by the recent global financial crisis, brought about by the greed and by the rapacious quest for growth that animate Western economic systems. But what is the source, really, of soft power? What is the force behind the ideas and behind the various international legal instruments, conventions, and declarations that UNESCO promotes around the world. First and foremost, the power stems from the international consensus. Behind a particular decision or position of UNESCO, one of the key functions of the organization is to set global standards in areas that fall within the unique mandate. And these are the areas, of course, of education, culture, science, communication, and information. Under the roof of UNESCO, the member states have, for example, enacted a number of conventions geared specifically towards the protection and preservation of world cultural heritage, which all too often become endangered due to the natural influences, not to mention the political ones. As early as in 1954, UNESCO elaborated the Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict. It is, of course, difficult to determine how many precious and invaluable sites have been scared destruction during an armed conflict. But we do know and feel the horror when we fail to protect such sites, as we did when the Taliban destroyed the Buddhas of Bamiyan, or when very recently the religious extremists attacked the sacred tombs and mausoleums in the fabled city of Timbuktu in Mali, which was an intellectual and spiritual capital and center for the propagation of Islam throughout Africa in the 15th and 16th century. The fact that such instances of barbarism are considered crimes against all the humanity and result in immediate action by the international community is largely due to the efforts of UNESCO to set standards and promote principles of cultural heritage preservation. A monumental project overseen by UNESCO to rebuild the original design of Old Bridge in the city of Mostar, which was destroyed during the Bosnian War, was ongoing international efforts to reconstruct 
the destroyed Buddhas of Bamiyan and the recent establishment by UNESCO of the Special Fund for Restoration and Preservation Efforts in Mali are examples only of multilateral culture diplomacy in action. Just recently, this past April, France, Brazil, and my country, Hungary, organized in UNESCO an experts meeting in the framework of the International Year of Water Cooperation at UNESCO, which featured a special session for the scientists from Israel and Palestine, who engaged in a discussion on the shared challenges of safeguarding a vital life resource. This meeting was a testament to the power of science to nurture a culture of cooperation and to create conditions for dialogue and peaceful coexistence. The UNESCO list of the normative instruments continues, of course, to include important conventions on prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of cultural property, the protection of the world, cultural, and natural heritage, the protection of the underwater cultural heritage, the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage, and the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions. Of course, in the relationship between Europe and the Levant, these protections are very important. An important source of UNESCO's soft power, its positive use of cultural diversity, both tangible and intangible. We celebrate in UNESCO diversity. I always say diversity is a source of inspiration and not a source of burden. And within the linguistic and cultural diversity of humankind, the concept of the mother tongue is central. UNESCO's 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage recognizes that all intangible cultural heritage domains, from knowledge about the universe to rituals, performing arts, and handicrafts, depend on language for their day-to-day -day practice and transmission through the succeeding generations. Poetry is a strong tool in this work, protecting of the mother tongue. Just this March, I was in Egypt. I opened an international poetry festival on the International Day of Poetry. We invited poems, poets from the Arab region, from the Levant, and from Europe. And it had a very strong political message about cross-cultural bridge building. The promotion of the international ethical norms and principles of science and technology is another example of UNESCO's ability to effect positive changes through cultural dialogue and consensus seeking. The Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights adopted by the General Conference in 2005 is a pioneering instrument that elaborates a universal framework that should govern the practice and application of medical and biological sciences in every country. Of course, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain, we just know too well that the totalitarian regimes have also endeavored to project soft power beyond their borders. However, we should not confuse soft power with political propaganda. Soft power is based on the belief that the attributes such as democracy, tolerance, openness, solidarity, will bring well-being and happiness to the lives of all the human beings. Interface and intercultural dialogue are actions in gender equality, education in competence building are all soft power methods in UNESCO. The financial crisis have arisen not only due to the economic circumstances, I believe, but largely from the absence 
of ethical approach, ethical thinking, and ethical action in the leading financial systems and institutions, banks, markets, even governments. Cultural diplomacy is our best hope of transforming traditional prejudices into attitudes of understanding and cooperation. Culture has the advantage of being a public good that all people can share. Today, we can speak of a world culture accessible to all by virtue of its shared humanity and transmit it freely and without censorship in its diversity beyond political frontiers by modern information technologies. I have a dream, ladies and gentlemen, soft power representing the future of international relations because we are destined to reach a level of consciousness where the threat of use of force, whether military or economic, will be simply unsinkable. Of course, we will never lose the human urge for competition, nor should we. The societies will continue to influence each other within the framework of culture of peace and mutual respect, competing in their ability to get others to adopt their goals through attraction and persuasion. Is it only a dream? Excellencies, dear friends, I must, in closing, acknowledge the indispensable role played by such a global civil society actors as the Romanian Foundation for Democracy, as the Institute of the Academy of Culture Diplomacy, the various cultural institutes all over the world, and the World Academy of Arts and Science, which has a long history of working alongside UNESCO in building international scientific networks. I will continue to endeavor to facilitate culture diplomacy using the resources and the experiences of these important institutions and partners of UNESCO. I would like especially to thank and congratulate the president of this conference and for his vision, for his power, for his creativity to invite all these wonderful creators, thinkers together. And I fully can associate myself with the Bucharest Declaration. Thank you very much.